You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. One. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we have back on Rob England of Appalachian Bronzeback Adventures. Uh, you know, that episode blew up and people really, I got messages and stuff of like, Hey, thank you so much for, for having somebody on about the upper James. Like no one talks about that. Like there's not a lot of information on it. And I didn't even know, like there was all these fishing opportunities. And then with that, I got a, a part of the Riverkeeper Alliance there. It, it, it is interesting because th- the James river flows through the heart of Virginia to Richmond if you are a big banker in Richmond, you can be on a musky trip with you in like five minutes. It's not that hard at all. It, but right. it's also shocking that there's still people that don't know about it, which to me, I guess it's because I'm too close to it. That Yeah, of course, it's great fishing. But yeah, right. it's always surprising to me that people don't know about those opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. And, and, and you're right. Um, you know, so the, the, it's the James. I, you may know this, but the James is the longest river in the United States solely within one state's borders. So it is a very so cool, a very long river. And it's really divided into, you know, essentially divided into three sections. Um, I fish what's considered the upper James, which I think that's maybe what you might be referring to a little more in that you know, people don't really know a whole lot about the upper James, which is a mountain stream, which goes from basically just above my house and iron gate, um, down to Snowden, and then um, from Snowden to um, uh, Richmond is considered the middle, considered the middle James, which is a Piedmont stream, and then from Richmond below the fall line down to Chesapeake, uh, where it enters the ocean, is the lower James, and that's considered uh, a tidal stream. So you know, the upper James is a very, very different river from you know well they're all they're all kind of unique in their own way but the upper james is extremely unique in that you know for, and, and 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 a sanctuary for smallmouth and muskie because you know we have a lot of deep stretches we have a lot of ledges uh we have a lot of boulders um you know that are exposed above the river uh big bluffs um so it's just very unique in that uh, and and the gradient that uh, creates, you know, some fast moving water, which then, you know, around a lot of the, uh, the pools and, you know, the, the, the rocks and the ledges and stuff creates these, these massive eddies, which again, you know, is a sanctuary for, you know, basically all the species of fish. As we're approaching it. And uh, I think we, we talked about this a little bit just before we started recording. Um, we're in a, a period of transition and you know, f- from your guide service, perspective with this transition you know how have you been i mean i think you were saying earlier that you're you're pretty busy leading up into july Uh, yeah yeah very very busy i mean i from uh basically from the end of february you know weather permitting you know march all the way through about the second week in june i mean i was other than just a a few days here and there i was going every single day and and, and those days that I didn't fish were days I actually had to block, whether it be, you know, I took some time to see my grandkids or, you know, I went to a baseball game up in Baltimore. Uh, but other than that, I was fishing every day. And um, in, the, in, in the post-spawn period of May, uh, when I say post-spawn, post-spawn uh, musky, uh, we went perfect. We, we were at 100% every trip we boated a fish. M- many trips we, we boated multiple fish. Unfortunately, we finally broke that streak in June, um, but we we were we started to experience very low, very clear water. Uh, we still had a lot of interest. I mean, there we had two trips where we didn't boat fish, but we we had hookups. And between those two trips that we didn't boat fish, we had twenty one follows. And you know, we the the figure eight is uh, in really clear low water is not is not an easy task it's there there's some skill to it and 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 i and i refer to it as stirring the cauldron um Hmm. because with that without a lot of skill or knowledge on how to do it and you know you know granted my clients were doing the best they could but you know i was trying to you know teach them and and guide them on the process but in low clear water you know that fish starts you know is following you can track them for 20 or 30 feet sometimes 
and they get close to the boat. And as soon as, if you don't get that, when I say stir the cauldron, if you don't drive the fish down and put that rod, I mean, almost up to the reel, you got to drive the fish down because if the fish comes up, first thing they see is you in the boat and they're gone. Um, so you really have to, you know, now, you know, if the, if the water's a little stained, um, not as critical, but still you're, you're better off really getting it down. So we had so many close calls on the, the number of fish that we, you know, we had near misses with. Um, and then, you know, once the water temperature, I mean, the water temperature got over 75 degrees is when we shut it down. But last week, um, we had four days of rain and not sure where you are, but we had three days. The highs were in the fifties. <laughs> yeah. So the water has actually dropped down again. Uh, I haven't gotten a water temperature check in the last few days, but, um, you know, right now musky fishing is kind of fluid, you know? Um, so, uh, don't have anything imminent right at the moment. Um, uh, but in terms of smallmouth, this time of the year, as you talked about transition, you know, summertime, you often face, you know, low, clear water. And that's not an easy task. Um, you know, the, 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 the window uh, for, you know, potential, the potential to catch big fish is going to be very early in the morning and, you know, let, you know, before, before dusk or even overnight, which we don't do any overnight trips. Um, but, but like I was saying last week, I mean, those fish, we, we, we experienced probably three, almost four weeks, of, you know, declining river levels, getting very clear. And I did have a couple of smallmouth trips and, you know, they were less than what I would say were, were fantastic, unfortunately. Um, but I had a father and son that I, I kind of had, they had some flexibility and I said, okay, just kind of, just kind of hold on until I feel like it's going to be the right time. And last Wednesday, um, I was able to get them out. We pretty much faced a steady rain all day. Um, and we boated a hundred fish. Dang. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's amazing how it changes. So as we go throughout the summertime, you know, and, and we get some rain, you really want to, ideally, you want to try to catch a rising river, not to the point where it's muddy, but if you catch a rising river when it's, you know, got some stain to it, or you're on the other side of the peak, um, when the water starts to come down, you know, you may, you may know, but there's, I, I, I don't know what the, the best term that I could say is it's, it's got kind of like a greenish, almost, uh, almost glacier melt, not quite. Ooh, yeah, color okay, to yeah. it. That's, that's the ideal water, man. That's, that's what you want to hit. If you can, if you can hit it right. So, you know, grant some people, you know, in terms of their schedules, you know, don't have a lot of flexibility and they schedule a trip and, you know, I'll throw out there, Hey, you know, maybe we ought to wait until this, this time or this date or whatever, but, you know, so we'll go. Um, uh, like I said, you know, low clear water can, can be tough. I mean, you can catch them. Um, but you know, you're going to experience a lot of 10 to 12 inch smallmouth. Some people love that and they have a great time and they, you know, it's a blast for them. But a lot of my returning customers, my client base know, you know, March and April for smallmouth. October and November, you know, late September, same for musky, except, you know, when they're spawning and you have to kind of work around that spawn. So, um, yeah, that's the kind of transition, uh, what we'll be looking at, you know, throughout the, uh, July and August is, you know, trying to find those times where we can get some rising water if we can, if not, um, you know, we will, if we have, you know, clear water and low water, we're going to, we're going to be at, we're going to be at the boat ramp in the dark in the morning and those first four hours say between six and 10 are going to be your best chance before that sun gets really high. Um, once the sun gets high, the fish are going to scatter and they're going to dive under, you know, deep ledges and they're really going to be tough. And, you know, it gets hot and um, it, it, it becomes a little tougher, but you know, you know, there's ways to catch them. Um, you just have to be you know, real diligent in your process. Do those fish in the summertime, because you see this on a lot of lakes, example, Smith Mountain Lake, a, a portion of the fish will switch to nighttime feeding, like like you said. Absolutely. Is, is, that what, is that what's happening when that flow rate gets so low? Yeah, yeah. So I'll give you an example. Um, I've got a guy that um, he doesn't do necessarily a podcast like you do, but he, I don't know if you call him an influencer or, or he does a lot of uh, videos. Content creator. Stuff. Yeah. What's YouTuber. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, his name's Matt. He, he's actually from my hometown, which is kind of cool. So we have a lot to talk about when he comes fishing. So, um, 
he, he, I tried to, unfortunately we had to postpone a number of times due to weather and I finally got him out. And I think it was, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing maybe three weeks ago or so. Um, and you know, unfortunately they kind of hit the low clear water, but they stayed in a campground over a natural bridge. And, uh, he, he sent me a, he sent me a text that I didn't get a chance to, to look at until, you know, first thing in the morning, but the night before we went fishing, him and his, his, his buddy that went, were, uh, were fishing with me, just walked out at the edge of the campground and we're throwing buzz baits. And at 1130 at night, he caught a 21 and three quarter inch smallmouth. Wow. At 1130. And then, you know, with me, we did pretty good, but we didn't, we didn't hit anything that big. You know, we had, you know, we had clear skies, pretty, fairly warm day. We, you know, we did good, but we, not great by the standards that I, that I typically would hope for. I, I, I want to come back to this, but I want to make sure that this is not glossed over. When you said you went perfect for musky, yep. there are still a lot of people that don't appreciate, and you probably have customers like this, how hard it is to actually catch one. And they assume that if they pay, they catch one. That's right. not necessarily the case. And this is like throwing a perfect game in baseball. If you're going <laughs> to go out 30, let's say 30 days in a row and stick one 30 days in a row, that's hard. It, I, it is. It is. And I can't speak for the other guides around here. You know, I don't stay in real close contact with them. Uh, there's one guy that's uh, fairly nearby that's a, you know, he's, he's a great guy. Um, and I see, you know, some posts uh, occasionally. So I don't know what their success rate uh, has been. Uh, but you're right. I mean, you know, people refer to muskie as the fish of 10,000 casts. Um, I've been very fortunate. You know, we just, you know, a lot of it has to do with, you know, the terrific population of muskie that we have. Um, and then I have to attribute a lot of it to, you know, the baits that we talked about the last time that I was on, uh, that my, uh, that my fishing, my fishing buddy makes. And, you know, he guides with me occasionally. His name's Dennis Perko. Uh, he makes, it's called Perko Lures. Um, he makes a, a variety of swim baits and glide baits. And, uh, I, right now I am, when I musky fish, I use 100% exclusive his baits. And that has been a big part of the difference. When we started, when I started using his baits, everything changed. I mean, we were catching musky, but not at the rate that we we're catching them now. So you're right. I mean, I, I'm, I've been incredibly blessed to have that kind of success rate. Um, hope it continues. Um, you know, I feel pretty confident that it will, you know, we, you know, we, we, we know, you know, the, their movements, uh, you know, there's resident fish that, you know, we know kind of where they hang out and, and we've caught them more than a couple times. Um, so, and, you know, the, the VD, uh, uh, the department of natural resources, you know, they put out a, a report every year, you know, they do a shocking in October and then they put out a, a, a report and then they do a forecast for the following year. And it just continues to be very strong and very good. And the outlook continues to be great. And, you know, we've, you know, we've also had very good weather the last couple of years. Uh, you know, we, we experienced some, uh, really high flows in 18, 19 and 20, which, uh, impacted the smallmouth significantly, but the, the musky are, you know, a little more hardy. You know, when I say impact, you know, the, the, the fry uh, for the smallmouth, you know, kind of have a tendency to get washed out and stuff, but, uh, the musky are strong and they're very hardy and they're, 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 uh, just continuing to, you know, you know, grow in popularity and, um, uh, you know, like I said, you know, our, our success rate's just been incredible and it's just been awesome. It's been a lot of fun. Are they still doing uh tagging of, of yes. musky on the James? They are. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Um, uh, a, a friend of mine, um, he is another guy that makes custom lures, not necessarily musky lures. Um, but it's uh, called Craig's Creek customs. He makes spinner baits and, um, his name's Thomas and, uh, he only lives a couple of miles from me. And, uh, uh, Thomas caught a, uh, a muskie in Craig's Creek, which is right around the corner from where I live. It's a tributary to the James and Thomas caught a muskie. I believe it was last year. I don't know how far up exactly a muskie go pretty good ways up Craig's Creek. So, uh, for people that may not know Craig's Creek, uh, runs all the way up into Craig County, um, and empties into the James here in Botetourt County. And, uh, I think above Newcastle, I think it's about a 60 mile stream. And there's muskie all the way up to Newcastle um, mm. and, and Ariskany, uh, which is a little small community. But anyway, uh, Thomas caught a muskie um, up in Craig's Creek that was tagged. And when when he when he called it in and they did some research on that fish, that fish had migrated all the way up from Buchanan, which in terms of river miles was probably 30 river miles, give or take. Wow. 
yeah. So they're they're you, we we catch a lot of them with the tags on them. That's ins- that's absolutely insane that they travel that distance. I saw a YouTube video uh, a couple days ago where it was in in Minnesota and in and this uh, camera team caught musky jumping a small I think it was a wing dam to, yeah. to get up during the spawn and I just like I, I didn't even realize that they would do something like that that's insane well you know they're they're an extremely powerful fish and you know they, they're almost like one big tail hmm. <laughs> you know the whole fish is like a big tail and um you know we've had we've had uh, times when you know we, we've had hookups and you know you don't want to get the line you know it, just like any fish that, that, that will, that will break the surface. Um, you know, when the line gets tight, small mouth will jump, but we've had musky, you know, well into the 40 inch range, jump out of the water and, and, and reach heights of like four feet. That's insane. I didn't even yeah, think that, they could jump. Wow. Oh yeah. <laughs> huh. I mean, you really don't want them to jump yeah. because you know, you're, you're risking, you know, lo- you know, the throwing the bait and that's exactly what they're trying to do. But yeah, to see a fish that size, get that kind of air is, is pretty, pretty, pretty incredible that's crazy um they're strong enough they're strong enough to make that distance something that that you mentioned and i know a lot of musky anglers talk about and i want to make sure this is reiterated for everyone that's listening um you know guys can check it out on youtube or you do apple podcast spotify iHeartRadio. the water temperature is really important to their ability to survive and it seems like a lot of people believe um you shouldn't be fishing for them or or you shouldn't target them as the water temperature rises. At what temperature is mortality an issue? 75. 75. Yep. So that's why, you know, I shut it off. Uh, I think the 14th or the 15th was my last kind of official day um, of, of musky fishing. And the reason being is they, I mean, they, that fish will literally fight you to its death. I mean, they, that's, that's, that's the kind of epic battle that you're in for. Um, and when you when you fish for them or catch them, you know, over that water temperature, they get a lactic acid buildup in their muscles. Very similar to a human. Uh, I'm a marathon runner. And that's something that you you try to avoid when you run a marathon, because there's a term when you run a marathon it's called hitting the wall. And a lot of times that'll happen somewhere in mile range 16 to 20. And a lot of it is because of lack of you know nutrition. You haven't really fed your body enough. And, uh, you get that lactic acid buildup in your muscles and your body just shuts down everything, your gait and everything goes, you know, haywire. Similar thing happens to a muskie, you know, it's hot water. They get hooked. I mean, they, you know, they're, you know, the battle's on and all of a sudden, and it, 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 it escalates exponentially in that warm water. Um, so if, if you do catch a fish in hot water, it, it, it's, it's highly recommended, um, that you, try to make that battle as short as possible hmm. and get that fish right back in the water. And, you know, this time of year, a lot of bass fishermen catch them because they are very opportunistic. You know, they'll, 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 you know, their metabolism is very high and they're going to go after, you know, sometimes we, we actually size down our baits a lot of time, you know, when we, when we get into May and early June. So it's, it's very common um, to, to catch them on, you know, a jerk bait or a crank bait, even a lot of plastics, and, you know, I would say not, not, this doesn't go for all bass fishermen, but I would say a lot of bass fishermen probably don't know a lot of those details about muskie. So, you know, they're trying to fight it and, and that's really dangerous uh, to, you know, you're maybe using eight pound line or 10 pound line and, you know, you have that fish on for 30 minutes. That very possibly could be a, a mortality issue for that fish. Hmm. No, I never even thought about that. But so then guys, I, I know because there's more, more and more people on social media commenting, like I want to target muskie, things like that. And, and I think it's also because the time of year, this is when people like to go fishing is, is their sure. kids are out of school. But just keep that in mind there so that we don't have an issue with mortality rate because these fish are not like blue cats where you can have, you know, 10,000 per square acre. It's just a different type of cat when it comes to how many are in a section of river. That Yeah, that's correct. And they're very territorial. Um, so you might find, you know, some smaller males that, you know, in the 30 inch range that would be hanging out around an area where a big female would be, but you're not going to find a lot of big females, uh, on average, you know, in the same general stretch of water. When I say general stretch, maybe a couple hundred yards or so. Um, I mean, we, we've experienced, you know, some areas that have, 
uh, a very dense population of muskie, but they are still going to be spread out. P- pivoting to the, the, the smallmouth, is it primarily this time of year as the flow rate gets down, is it the upper end where you're located? Is that where the most smallmouth, is that where the best chances of catching smallmouth is, or is it going to be the middle portion going towards Richmond? Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know a lot about that, uh, that, that stretch of water. Um, but, but, you know, the summer, what the summer pattern, the way, the way the summer pattern kind of works is that, you know, they're, they're going to, they're just like humans. They're going to try to find the most comfortable place that they can find. And oftentimes that's in swift current. It's more oxygen, got moving water, you know, they've got food, you know, coming to them. Uh, whereas, you know, when you're in the colder months, you know, they're going to be in the deep stretches. Um, you know, you're going to, you know, they're going to be hanging out, in the, you know, cause that's going to be more comfortable for them, uh, in the colder water because they don't want to expend a lot of energy because their metabolism is fairly low. Now their metabolism is really high and they want to be in, you know, moving water. And, 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 you know, as, as I spoke to earlier, you know, early in the morning mm-hmm. and, you know, in the afternoon. They'll move up onto these these shallow flats, you know, as you get, you know, lower light and begin to feed. Um, but, yeah, generally speaking, you know, so so in that middle section of, you know, the middle James, I'm sure there are rapids. Um, I know there are a lot of dams between Snowden and, uh, well, at least Lynchburg. Anyway. Lynchburg, yeah. I think there's like seven. So I think, you know, probably just below those dams are probably really good. But, it, you know dams back up water and you're going to have some deep, slow water. Not that you can't catch them there, but probably middle of the day, it's going to be m- more few and far between. That, that, that's really interesting because about the water temperature. I mean, what are you, is it more the water temperature or the flow rate that signifies summertime patterns? Or I'm assuming it's the temperature. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a little of both actually. Um, you know, as I, as I spoke to earlier, you know, one of the things that you know, we kind of, uh, is, is lightning in a bottle when we get some rain, um, and, and, you know, brings the river up. And so, you know, we'll get, you know, we'll get some stain and, you know, rain's going to cool the water down a little bit too. So, you know, say we could be, you know, in the 70, let's say we're 74 degrees and, and, uh, you know, we have a, you know, significant rain or a couple day rain and it drops down to 74, you know, when you have that drop in temperature during the summertime, that's, that's a good thing. And then you have rising water levels. And, you know, I, I, I had an experience uh, uh, last Wednesday where I had a father and son that had some flexibility. And I kind of put them on hold because we were in some low, clear water, you know, for about three weeks. And, we, you know, we had this forecasted rain coming. And so we were kind of watching. And I said, just kind of hold tight. And, you know, when, when you hear from me, and I'll try to pick the best scenario that I can possibly to get us out. And, uh you know, previously to that trip, you know, we, we had some trips that were, you know, they were okay. They weren't great by my standards. Um, but we were able to get out Wednesday. We were in a steady rain all day. Uh, we had picked up about a foot in water, but you know, it wasn't muddy. It was a long, steady, slow rain, which is exactly what we needed because if you get a, you know, a hard thunderstorm and it just piles rain into the watershed, that's when you're going to get mud. But the ideal situation is a long, steady Mm -hmm. rain. Consequently, we were able to get out and we, and we boated hundred fish and we had uh, an 18 inch fish. We had a 17, uh, we had a number of fish in the teens. I mean, it, it is as completely opposite end of the spectrum that it was three or four days before that. So, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit of both, but the, the water level this time of year dictates a lot of things, but also the temperature because, you know, when it gets low and clear and it gets warm, you know, the fish are just get really uncomfortable. And that's when they, that's when they pull out and they get into the swift water. And sometimes you'll find them in the rowdiest water. I mean, not like class three rapids, but you know, right on the edge of, of that, of that really hard moving water where, you know, I've had a lot of clients say, man, I wouldn't think that they would be there. And we're just, you know, we're just hammering those areas and throwing, throwing, throwing at them. And, you know, that's where we find them a lot. And a lot of times too, is uh, I've heard this, term used um uh i always you you find these areas where you've had you have this foam Mm -hmm. build up and i always say foam is home or fish the foam because that's typically a reversing you know you got an eddy there 
where the water is, you know, hitting some rocks and it's, you know, you got a little bit of a circular movement and you've got, you know, a lot of oxygen. That's why the, that's why the bubbles and the foam are there and bait fish will get into those areas and get disoriented and a small mouth are like, okay, yeah, we're just going to pick these things off. They just, they just sit in those areas and wait for that, that bait to get in that swirl and you know, it's over. It, it's so funny that you mentioned that because I, I, I've said on live streams before, um, and then guys, if you're listening, I always do a live stream on Monday night about wade fishing and that this is the time of year that I think people, if they're just going to go out and fish the river, they will catch something because it's it's way easier to have bank access because it's the riffles, it's the rapids, that's where it is. Because you can compare and contrast that with when, when it's winter time, you have to be able to get to a deep hole, which is insanely hard because it bunches them up. And so for, for anglers out there that are listening, yeah, this is the time of year that you can get your shoes on, you can go wade, you can find the, the fastest moving foamy water, and you can actually have success. You might not catch a big one, but that that's where you can actually have some success with that. And, oh, were you going to say something? No, go ahead. Um, it's an interesting thing about the James, though, is as you go up, it's a tale of two halves with the cow pasture and the Jackson. And the mm-hmm. Jackson being the 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 below muma which is about 200 feet deep and is pulling really cold water do they fish differently this time of year if you could compare and contrast those two or are they fish the same fish uh, which differently the cow pasture and jackson well the yeah that's a great question um the the jackson so the first 18 miles of the jackson is wild trout water um and and that can well it doesn't 100% 100% conclude at the paper mill, West yeah. Baco paper, Covington. There will, there will be some trout that make it down past um, the paper mill. As a matter of fact, that trip that I had the other day that I was talking about where we caught a hundred fish, uh, the, the young man, the son uh, landed a 16, 16 inch rainbow. Wow. Uh, yeah. We were probably 10 miles below the paper plant. So they, they make it in there, but the Jackson probably uh, down to Clifton Forge, Maybe a little, well, probably a little further. Uh, well, probably almost to the cow pasture, actually. Generally speaking, is going to be about 10 degrees colder than the James. That's insane. Wow. Yeah, it, it makes a huge difference. Makes a huge difference. Um, so, yeah, you can, uh, the Jackson is kind of my, is, uh, I'm, almost, I'm trying to find the right term. It's, I wouldn't say it's my go-to, but it's kind of my ace in the hole. When, you know, the Mari gets real low and the Jackson or the James will get real low. I can always go to the Jackson. The Jackson will get low, but it's there's always going to be a constant level to the to the Jackson because they have to continue to release water from Muma. Um, now you know they may release it at a different rate at different times of the year. It just depends. But yeah, the Jackson is always going to be colder, and consequently, you know, when it when it's when it's on, man, it's you know you, there's always great opportunities to have days of 70, 75. 100 fish. Now, granted, you're going to catch a ton of fish in the 10 to 12 inch range. It's still a lot of fun. You'll catch but, something. Yeah. But there are fish in there that, you know, that are citation sized fish. That is such a unique fishery. And, and, and you brought up the Murray and the cow pasture, but let's talk about the Murray real quick. If the, if the water level gets too low because the flow rate, is that still something that people can kayak or float? They can. Um, yeah. And, and so the Mari, you know, it's actually pronounced the Mari. I'm Mari. Mari. Okay. A-U-R-Y. Um, it was, uh, it actually reached a point uh, there a while back where I couldn't navigate my raft any longer. I've got a 15 foot raft. Holy moly. So once it gets below 200 CFS, uh, it's really hard for me. Um, my, my, my raft and frame without people is 600 pounds. Hmm. Uh, Once you add, you know, three adults, myself and two fishermen. Now when it's, you know, right around two feet or a little above, you know, I can, I can get one person out. Um, But having two people, I I really prefer two and a half to three feet. But to answer your question directly, kayaks and canoes can still get out. You know, they may have to, you know, get out and push off some rocks. Uh, But, you know, they have, they have less draft, um, you know, a lot less weight. Um, and with the low flows, you know, in the, you know, water's fairly warm, you know, it's fairly easy. You know, when you get, when you get hit, you know, you're hitting rocks, you're, you know, typically in a, a foot or less of water. So it's nothing to, you know, jump out, you know, push the kayak a little bit, get back in and, you know, continue on your way. That's insane. It gets so low that a raft can't even get through there. That's damn. I didn't know it, it got that low. 
Wow. Well, my lesson uh, a couple of years ago, you know, trying to get through there in low water and a couple of times, you know, I was out of the boat 20 times, you know, pushing off of rocks. And, you know, I mean, it, it there, there was one day in particular and that's kind of what changed it for me. I'm like, you know, I got to be smarter about this um, where, and I had two young men that were very light, you know, they were actually college students at Washington, Washington and Lee hmm. over in Lexington. And, um, I, I think I was out of the boat 30 times that day. And by the oh, by the time, dude. And it was hot, it was hot. And by the time, you know, we were getting toward the end of the day, I, I, my energy level was so low, I was falling down. I was falling down the river. I said, I, I can't do this. This is actually dangerous for me. Um, so yeah, I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, let's not do that. That's insane. Um, God, I can't believe it gets that low there, but that's something just to keep in mind though. And, and the reason I bring that up is with, with people taking their kids out to go kayaking or floating, whatever, you need to understand what flow rate means. You need to understand that before you drive all the way out there and then find out that you're going to be beached. Goose Creek near us, same thing. It gets super low in the summertime. And if you don't check that flow rate, it's just, you just wasted your whole day getting out there. And it can also be a safety thing as well. Sure. Yeah. And the cow, I don't fish the cow pasture much, but it, you know, it, the cow pasture and the Mari have very few tributaries. You know, the tributaries to those to those rivers are more like, you know, little springs, you know, tiny little creeks, you know, whereas, you know, the James has, well, both the Jackson and the cow pasture are tributaries. Craig's Creek, Catawba Creek, Cedar Bluff Creek, the Mari River. I mean, you have a lot of tributaries which can raise the river level quite, you know, pretty quick. Whereas the Mari and the in the the cow pasture don't have those, so in the summertime you really need to check those gauges before you go out, so you know you know what you what what you might be facing. What are you looking for gauge wise, just to, for people to know at home that's safe? Uh, three feet. Three feet. Three feet. Three feet of gauge. Yep. Uh, well, it's it's de- it depends on what your definition of safe. Is. <laughs> you know, so you know the low the, the low water can can be tricky. Just because your your sight lines and your passages get very narrow, so you're having to avoid rocks, and you 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 know especially if you're in a canoe or a ki- kayak, you know you you can you know experience breaching you know your 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 craft. Um, now on the other end of the spectrum, um, I would say you know like it's, on the James, I won't go out over five feet. Uh, we were very close to that the other day um, because of these four days of rain. Then we had a surprise thunderstorm way upstream and, and it man it went up it spiked overnight we thought we were going to be in a great situation not ideal um but we were just under five feet and man i mean that river just pushed hard and you know i i saw some folks out it was a beautiful day but i saw some folks out in canoes and kayaks on the james that day and people weren't wearing life jackets i'm like that is mm-hmm. so you really take i mean they might have been expert kayakers and canoeists but when you're up around five feet, man, that river is moving and, you know, it, it can happen so fast. And I, it, you know, it, it was everything I could do just to, you know, it's not my place, but it was everything I could do to just to say, man, you guys really should be wearing your life, you know, your, your personal flotation device. It, it becomes a safety issue. And, and I think this is, this is a funny topic because there's a couple of, there's a couple of lakes that are near, that are near me and, the homeowners associations came in, uh, bought up the boat ramp, and now they put it to where you can't fish between, I think it's like mid-October till April because of water conditions. And, and to my mind, it's like the people that are out fish are out on the water then are the experienced outdoorsmen that know what they're doing. The right. issue is just like with the drowning at Lake Anna like a month ago, it's it's July. It's when you get these people that go to Dick's Sporting Goods, they buy a kayak because they want to do it, and they don't know what the hell they're doing. That's the time that you're going to see the most injuries by far. We had a, a situation, it's been several years ago now, but, and I, and I may have talked about this in the last podcast. I don't recall, but say it again. Uh, what's that? Do it again. <laughs> okay. Well, there was a, 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 a guy and his girlfriend, he was a baseball player at the university of Charlotte. Um, and they had gone up to the new river. Um, mm-hmm. That's when I was living in North Carolina and uh, they had gone up to the new river and it was late October, but it was, an, it was one of these October days. that was, you know, like 80 degrees. So, they go out there in shorts, t-shirts, very inexperienced. Water level was up, and they flipped their their boat. Um, it was a tragedy that the the guy, the the, the baseball player at, at UNC Charlotte, he he drowned, and his girlfriend survived. But you know that's one of those times when you know you're going out based on the the weather conditions and not for the season. Mm-hmm. 
really have to prepare for the season because the water temperature in late October, a lot of times you're looking at low fifties, give or take, and you know, hypothermia sets in within a few minutes at that temperature. So, you know, 80 degree air temperature feels great. Yeah. Let's go out. You know, great day. It's beautiful outside. It's fall, you know, to get the leaves changing and to really just need to take some time to do some research, whether it be the internet, you know, people can call me anytime. I, you know, you know, I'm, I'm okay with somebody texts me, calls me say, Hey, what do you think is, you know, what, what, what's the river look like? What's the water temperature? You know, if I can help someone in terms of safety, I, I'd be more than happy to do that. Yeah, because the safety thing is big right now. And, and, and as we talk about that with inexperienced people on the water, how busy now the Shenandoah where I'm located is a little different because we're like right on the edge of Northern Virginia and D.C. But down where you're at, how much do you get the summertime traffic and how crazy does it get? Well, uh, so the there's there's a there's a library down in Buchanan uh, called Twin River Outfitters. And I know those guys. Great guys. They do a phenomenal job. And they've been a great, they've, they've been great for this area in the community. So, um, so the, the area basic, so I 81 run interstate 81 runs very close to Buchanan. Um, in fact, you could actually, yeah, you, there's an, there exit 168 is right there between Arcadia and Buchanan. So if you go say up river to like Springwood, which is maybe five or six miles upstream, and then you go the same distance the other way uh, down to the Arcadia takeout, that area absolutely gets hammered in the summertime. You know, canoers, kayakers, tubes. So the, the, the river traffic is extremely high. Um, where, where I go, um, you know, I'm up on the Jackson. Um, I'm up, up on the very upper James. I'm on the Mari. Yes, it gets some traffic, but not nearly at the volume, say, you know, that proximity to I-81 has. A little harder to get there. Some of the accesses aren't, you know, as easy. Um, and and there's some pretty precipitous rapids where I think I talked about in my last uh, podcast with you is that, you know, one of my niches is, you know, and I kind of pride myself on, I go where other people don't go or aren't willing to go. Um, and it's because a lot of times the water is pretty gnarly, but that makes for great fishing. And it kind of keeps out a lot of your recreational type, you know, canoe or kayakers. And, I, and I'm not saying that, I, you know, I'm, I'm discouraging people from, you know, floating those areas. I'm not. It, you know, it, the river belongs to everybody. So, um, you know, but generally speaking, we don't get as much traffic in the areas that I fish as, say, you know, those areas that I spoke about between, you know, Springwood and, say, Arcadia. I kind of stay away from those areas this time of year. But once it gets cold. Um, then I'll be back fishing those areas as it doesn't get a whole lot of traffic. That's so important to really recognize and understand uh, when you plan a trip, because I know the main stem of the Shenandoah, Saturday and Sunday, just don't go. There's, we call them just <laughs> the floating fruit loops, which are all the people in the inflatables. And it's like a sea. You can see it when you cross seven, which is there. It's insane. And you just got to like be aware of that. And it's not something that's advertised. You just have to have that, that insider common knowledge that you just can't effectively fish these areas that time of year. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a flotilla. It is. It's, it's insane. Um, but you know, make sure everyone link in the episode description, everything we talked about as always, uh, baits, that was a really hot thing that we, uh, that we did last time people loved. Uh, what do you have for us this time? Yeah. So, uh, something hot, hot off the press. Um, you know, as we, you know, right now, you know, obviously we're, we're in summer and, you know, we, we, you know, we, we I, I don't have the volume of trips that I have that I have, you know, in the spring and the fall, because most of my clientele base, you know, they know now they've been here many times. They know that's when the time's the target. So, you know, like in October, October, I have like nine days left that are open. Uh, awesome. November starting to fill end of September starting to fill up, but I do still have some availability. So we're going to be using a lot of the, you know, the traditional stuff that we use in the fall, but this year we're going to, we're going to go with something different than something that's getting very popular. And that's, uh, you know, swim baits. Um, oh, cool or smallmouth. And one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite overall crankbaits for smallmouth in the spring and the fall is called a bandit crankbait, uh, square bill hmm. runs about three, five feet deep and uh, it's brown with an orange belly. And, you know, my friend Dennis that I talk about a lot, uh, has mimicked, um, the bandit in this five and a half inch glide bait. This is called a pickpocket. And, uh, it has this, uh, has this flange in the middle and it has a very tight, radius you, huh. you know, 
the, the way to operate this is you, you pump the reel about a half turn and this bait will turn very sharp to the right. And then when you pump it again, it'll make a very sharp turn back to the left, almost at a 90 degree angle. Whereas, you know, a lot of glide baits and I like, you know, those other type of glide baits too. And I have some that, you know, when you, when you make, when you do that pump, it'll kind of more of a, a turn and it'll kind of glide out and drift and then, you know, kind of turn back and make this slow glide out and drift. So, uh, we are definitely going to, uh, to use this, this year. Um, this, this color will, you know, brown and orange is always a hot color. And the other cool thing is that he does with his base is put, he puts on these tracking strips. Oh, that's uh, ingenious. Wow. Yeah. So you can, so you can watch the action of the bait to make sure you're doing it correctly. And then the other thing is you get it snagged up. You, you know, it's very, it's visible in you know, some deeper water. Cause, uh, these, these baits run about $90, so they're not inexpensive. But, you know, I spoke, I think I spoke uh, uh, in the last podcast, you know, a lot of the musky baits, and these will catch musky too, by the way. Um, a lot of the musky baits that Dennis makes, uh, Perco Lures, you know, run 100 to $150. I never thought I would ever spend that kind of money, uh, ow, that's a sharp hook, um, on, on a bait like this. Um, but they work, and that's why I use them. And so that's, that's the, uh, that's the bandit pattern. Uh, one of the very, very common, um, uh, bait fish for musky and smallmouth around here and all all uh, game fish is sculpin. Hmm. That's a sculpin pattern. The sculpin is like a goby in a way in that it has, it's a bladderless type uh, bait fish that kind of hugs the bottom of the river. And uh, smallmouth absolutely love them. Uh, but, you know, basically everything else does too. It also has a tracking strip. And then uh, a, a, a pattern that has been very, very successful for us, musky fishing, um, is the mad tom pattern. It's got this yellow belly. And if, if folks don't know what a mad tom is, it's a baby catfish. And that's just about exact. I, in fact, I, I pulled one out of a small mouse mouth about uh, a month and a half ago. And it, it wasn't even a, a huge fish. I mean, it was probably a two, two and a half pound fish, but it had this jammed in its throat and it was still eating. <laughs> that's <laughs> so, insane. Really excited to use these in the fall. Um, and uh, I, I expect that we're going to catch some really, really big smallmouth this year on these. Because of the musky situation, what kind of gear are you throwing that on? Because you could always hook just a, a monster. Yeah, so uh, seven seven foot six is what I use. Uh, uh, seven foot six heavy action uh, bait casting that can throw up to ten ounce lures. Um, I like, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there on the market. Um, you know, for the money, I like uh, Bass Pro Shops has something called a musky predator rod. Uh, it's fairly reasonable, but for the for the for the price, I think it's one of the best rods on the market. I mean, you know, you can go out there and spend a thousand dollars on an outfit. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not going to do that for guiding. Um, you know, some people do, and that's fine. Uh, but I like to be somewhere in the you know three to four hundred dollar range or or a little bit less if I can. Um, use eighty pound braid. Um, and a hundred, uh, hundred pound fluorocarbon leader. Now that sounds like a little bit of overkill and it, it, it probably is, but the other reason that, well, the other reason that I use that, that heavy, uh, line and, and leader is because when you're throwing a hundred to $150 lure and you get it snagged, you can put a little bit of pressure on that and, and, and get it out of a tree or, you know, a deep, a, a deep, um, snag or something like that. Whereas, you know, you're using 10 pound fluorocarbon. Or, or mono, you can't use a whole lot of pressure on a bait before it's going to snap off. How heavy are those uh, glide baits you just showed us? Um, I, you know, I, just spitball. Uh, I think they're just. I think they're like three ounces. Okay. All right, that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, about three ounces. Yeah, because it's just like that, that. That's heavy gear for that little bit of a that little bitty bait, but that makes sense well, though. Now, we're not going to be throwing these on that. I'll be throwing these probably. Uh, with 15 pound braid and probably 10 pound fluorocarbon leader. Gotcha. Okay. Good, 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 good clarification there. Um, yeah. Cause matching the hatch with that, but I do agree. Like if you're throwing those glide baits, cause glide baiting is all the rage right now. And on eBay, some baits are like retailing for 1200 bucks. Oh my beef up. Yeah. I mean, beef up your tackle. Cause you don't want to lose that investment or your wife is going to absolutely murder you. Um, right. yeah. One, and one thing I was going to, I, I was going to add, uh, about, you know, these baits and, and, and why, you know, in the fall we size up because as the season goes along, the bait that survives in the river 
gets big. So as you get into the fall, whether you're fishing for musky or you're fishing for smallmouth, you want to start to size that bait up. Um, here's uh, the guy that I was talking about earlier. Um, that, that's the uh, YouTube guy, Matt. Um, he made he made these for me. Uh, bear with me just a second. I should have had them out of the box. But uh, one of one of my favorite patterns is a is a jerk bait. Um, so this is a uh, this is something that Matt made. Um, this oh, wow. is uh, kind of mimics. Uh, Rapala has a pattern called Mossback Shiner. So it's got this kind of bluish hue bottom mm. and then olive green top. Um, so we, we typically size, size up our baits um, in the fall. And typically I'll use like a ripstop, Rapala ripstop, which is an 09, or Rapala x wrap that's an 08. Um, this one is probably uh, an 11 if, if, if you were kind of measuring against Rapala standards. Um, so, uh, use this a little bit. Uh, we've had some success. You know, we, uh, had that hundred fish day the other day, we were throwing these because we had some stained water and we, we caught some nice fish on this, but, uh, really going to focus on these in the fall as, as well as these, these swim baits over here. Do, do you throw any Ned rigs, tubes or anything like that in the summertime? Wacky rigs? Oh yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I just have some of these, um, give it, try not to give away all my secrets, but a lot of people know about this now. So this little guy right here, um, is like a Ned rig on steroids. Um, this is made, this is made by Z man. Mm, yep. And, uh, it's called a micro finesse jig. It's one eighth ounce. You, you know, they make them, they make them even lighter than this. Anytime I'm throwing any type of a Ned rig, I go as light as I possibly can. Um, but this, this is actually called peanut butter and jelly. So there's a Z man TRD peanut butter and jelly trailer. And then a Z-Man micro finesse peanut butter and jelly uh, micro finesse jig. And that right there may be the best smallmouth bait I have ever used, period. Uh, every, every season, spring, summer, winter, fall, um, you know, it, it's, 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 very, it's very small, very finesse. Um, but especially when you get into those tough times when you have low clear water or you know, the fish, uh, you know, you're in really, really cold water and the fish are very lethargic. Now in the winter time or, you know, early spring, I might size up to like a three sixteenths or even a quarter depending on the water flow. But, um, you know, the cool thing about those is that, you know, you can cut cause they, they sit up on top of their end right like that. And you can dead stick these. Mm. And even, you know, when it's sitting still, you know, you got these tentacles, you know, kind of flowing around, you got that tail kind of waving around like that. So even when you're not doing anything, this bait's still working for you. That's crazy. Like, like that commercial that Roland Martin has, you know, about Yamamoto. You know, you don't work the bait, the bait works for you. And that's kind of similar to that right there. That is a, that is a throwback. I remember those commercials. Good <laughs> Lord. Yeah. He throws the pack to that little kid yeah. on the dock. Thanks, Thank mister. Oh my gosh. Rob, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Um, just, you're always a fountain of wisdom. Again, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Go buy some glide base, get yourself prepped and also try to book a trip with them one more time, just to make sure people didn't forget it. You know, how can they book a trip with you and when do you have openings? Yeah. So, uh, you can, you can reach me, uh, through my website. Um, it's a P P bronzeback, a D V.com. Um, you can, uh, find me on Facebook. Uh, I'm on Facebook is Rob England. And then, and then in parentheses, Appalachian Bronzeback Adventures. Uh, I'm on Instagram as Appalachian Bronzeback Adventures. Um, and then on my website, my phone number's on there. You can, you can contact me through my website. It has an inquiry form, or you can just call me, uh, uh, at my, the phone number that's listed. Um, so there's a number of ways, uh, to reach out, uh, and, um, and connect with me. Um, and my email's on there. It's app bronzeback ADV at gmail.com. So very similar to the website. And, uh, I, I have, I still have uh, a good bit of openings in September. Hopefully September, late September will be like September last year. We've had a, thus far, we've had a very mild spring. Like I said, we had three days last week yeah, that were in it's the weird. 50s. Um, and it, you know, we've had, we've had no 90 degree days yet. Um, so I'm crossing my fingers that, you know, we're going to have an early fall and we were able to start musky fishing in September last year. That, that typically is a little fluid because 
you know, we got to get down below 75. But I do have openings uh, still at the end of September. I have nine dates left in October. That That's prime time. That's insane. If, if you want to catch big smallmouth, big musky, that's the time to do it. And then uh, my November, you know, a lot of people think, well, the calendar turns over to November. You know, well, it's too cold. Fishing's done. We've had some great weather the last couple of years in November. I mean, you know, 70 degree days, we're, you know, water temperatures, you know, still hanging around in the you know, in the fifties, you know, almost all the way up to Thanksgiving. So, uh, musky fishing will continue to be very good. Smallmouth fishing will be really good. Once that temperature gets below 50, it, it starts to get tough. I mean, you can still catch some huge fish, but you know, your catch rates are probably going to come down just a little bit. Dude, you're awesome. Thank you so much again for coming on again, guys, like, and subscribe to the channel it really helps us in the algorithm. Uh, we are the number one fishing show in the greater DMV metropolitan area. We'll see you next time on fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Aarons and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's bait and tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.